and welcome to Drive with the DW Motor Magazine. Coming up, natural gas on the go, Volkswagen's new Polo TGI. We're off to Turkey for the Sea to Sky Endurance Race. And Mercedes Posh new pickup. With its new X-Class, Mercedes is breaking into a segment the German car maker has never tried before in a bid to attract new customers to the brand. Our car tester says it's the first of its kind. Until now, Mercedes-Benz had never built a pickup truck. That changes with the X-Class. It's brawny, wide enough for a shipping pallet in the back, and sturdy enough to go off-road. This time, we'll test drive the production version. Mercedes already showed off its X-Class concept truck at the Geneva Motor Show last spring. Its aggressive design caught everyone's attention, with a huge grill, slender headlights, and flared wheel wells. Unfortunately, the production version is tame by comparison. Feinold says what jumps out are the Mercedes star and the radiator grill, the massive bumpers, and the wide toe, more than 1.6 meters, both front and rear. This not only gives the X-Class a beefy appearance, it also helps to stabilize the pickup on the highway. Off-road, the X-Class's ground clearance of more than 20 centimeters helps it stay out of trouble. A striking feature is the X-Class's grill. The production version has larger headlights than the concept. In the rear, the X-Class boasts vertical tail lights and a massive bumper. Final says pickups have to be tough, whether they're going off-road or hauling heavy loads. The X-Class can carry up to 1.1 tons on its bed and tow up to 3.5 tons. The tailgate alone can withstand up to 150 kilograms. But despite all these talents, the two-ton truck drives almost like a car. The new X-Class offers a choice of two diesel engines. We tested the more powerful 140 kilowatt version. Mercedes rates fuel consumption at 7.8 liters for every 100 kilometers. The truck emits 207 grams of carbon dioxide per kilometer, and the top speed is 175 kilometers per hour. Reynolds says the X-Class is more comfortable than its competitors, a big plus on longer journeys. What's unusual for Mercedes is the conventional handbrake and automatic gear selector lever mounted on the center tunnel. Typical for Mercedes are the air vent nozzles in the dashboard. In fact, the X-Class looks very refined for an SUV. What's more, it seats five people. And as luxurious as its interior is, the pickup can handle rough terrain with ease. Reinhold says it's time to see what the X-Class can do off-road. To find out, we took it to a special test track. The X-Class faces a tough climb and wades through water up to 60 centimeters deep. A 25-degree descent and 30-degree climb are sufficient for most construction sites and the boat ramp at the lake. All variants of the pickup come with rear-wheel drive and manual six-speed gearbox as standard. Switchable 4MATIC four-wheel drive is available at a surcharge for all engine types. The seven-speed automatic is only available with the current top model, the X250D, which we're testing. Mercedes Christian Pohl says the X-Class is a real off-roader and a real pickup, so 4MATIC is the perfect all-wheel drive system for off-road use. For more challenging terrain, it offers gear reduction as well as a differential lock, and that really pulls it through just about anywhere. And there's more power on the way for the X-Class. Next year, Mercedes plans to roll out a version powered by a 190-kilowatt, 3-liter diesel V6.
Reynolds says the Mercedes X-Class adds new momentum to the pickup sector. Technically, the X-Class is a close relative of the Nissan Navara. It's built in the same Nissan factory in Barcelona, but the Navara is around 10,000 euros cheaper. He says he wishes the X-Class would have looked like the concept truck at the Geneva Motor Show. But even if the pickup could have been a bit more daring in its design, this latest Mercedes model is still bound to turn heads wherever it goes. The challenge the entire automotive industry is facing now is how to cut emissions. But there are many ways to do that. Diesel has fallen out of favor and electric power faces many hurdles, but other alternatives are often overlooked. Cortes de Manuel is well aware of how controversial diesel is, but what's the alternative? The German government is pushing electric and hybrid drives, but they're costly to make and to buy. So for now, Volkswagen is developing cars that run on CNG, or compressed natural gas. Specifically, natural gas is almost all methane. When burned in an engine, it releases about 25% less CO2 than gasoline does, and less particulate matter and nitrogen oxide. So VW will be offering a CNG version in each of its range lines. Jens Anderson of Volkswagen flatly rejects the notion that the auto industry will be able to go all electric with batteries in the near future. He insists that's physically impossible, even if there are many transportation needs that can be adequately met by battery electric vehicles. And CNG should not be seen as a competitor to electric drive, but rather as a complement. He agrees that long-chain and cyclic hydrocarbons must be phased out, but says more can be done with conventional drivetrains, and here methane is especially attractive mehr tun bei den konventionellen Antrieben und da ist der Betrieb mit Methan besonders attraktiv. The newest member of VWC and Chief Family is the Polo TGI. It's powered by a three-cylinder bivalent engine, meaning it can use two kinds of fuel. In addition to the gasoline tank, it carries two natural gas tanks under the floor of the trunk. Running on natural gas, the Polo consumes 3.2 kilograms per 100 kilometers and emits just 87 grams of CO2 per kilometer. Zunächst erstmal Anderson explains that Volkswagen has specially designed the engines to run on natural gas. So they don't have to be converted after the fact. The engine's operation has to be dry and smooth, so VW has redesigned the cylinder heads. It's something the company is able to add across its engine range. Methane can not only be extracted from non-renewable sources, but also from renewable alternatives. In biogas plants, for example, this is another important factor in preserving the environment. Emmanuel points out that natural gas cars cost much less than electric or even hybrid cars. He takes the Polo as an example. The natural gas version started just under 20,000 euros in Germany. Are the CNG models worth the additional 7,000 euros over the purely gasoline-powered models? Maybe not in the short run, but longer term, the lower fuel consumption not only saves money at the pump, but helps preserve the environment by cutting down on CO2 emissions. Anderson emphasizes that this is not just a stopgap solution. He says in the long term we'll have to learn to deal with natural gas power alongside battery electric power. And judging by the current state of technology, we'll also have to deal with fuel cell powered vehicles. So it would be a good idea to learn to handle natural gas energy sources.
Emmanuel adds that the advantage over an electric vehicle is that you can simply drive to the filling station, fill the tank in less than 10 minutes, and drive on. But once an electric vehicle's battery is empty, you have to plug it in, and then you can't drive anywhere until it's recharged. But what does it feel like to drive a Polo TGI? The natural gas polo is too loud for Emmanuel's taste. The engine doesn't run smoothly. But he says that has less to do with the natural gas and more to do with the three cylinders. Otherwise, it's hard to see or feel any difference between gasoline and CNG drive. So using natural gas doesn't mean giving up any of the fun of driving. Aside from the lower purchase price, another plus for the natural gas polo over electric drive is that range is no concern. Emmanuel once again reminds us of the advantage of the natural gas polo using both CNG and gasoline. Once the natural gas tank is empty, you can keep going on gasoline until you reach the next natural gas filling station. Porsche has unveiled the GTS version of its 718 Cayman. With its 2.5-liter four-cylinder boxer engine and an optimized turbocharger, the GTS now delivers 269 kilowatts of power, 12 more than the Cayman S. The Cayman GTS shoots from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 4.6 seconds. Prices for the Cayman GTS start at 76,000 euros in Germany. Lamborghini has launched its first SUV. The Urus offers luxury and superlative performance. It reaches 100 kilometers per hour in just 3.6 seconds and has a top speed of 305 kilometers per hour, making it the fastest SUV on the market. And as you would expect for a Lamborghini, its angular design exudes sportiness. All of this comes at a price. The Lamborghini Urus will be available in Europe next spring, starting at 171,000 euros. Kemer is a popular Turkish seaside resort, and one weekend a year, it's the venue for the Sea to Sky Extreme Enduro Motorcycle Race. This year marks the eighth edition of the three-day event. 180 riders from 23 countries are taking part. The main race starts on the beach before heading into the forest and up Olympos Mountain to the finish. Um, I had a real good day. I managed to be in fun most of the day, um, just keeping a good flow, having fun. There are 11 checkpoints along the 65 kilometer long route. Steep cliffs and stony sections make the course a real challenge. Sea to Sky is regarded as one of the hardest extreme enduro races. With its constantly changing conditions, the three-day race pushes many riders to their limits, both physically and mentally. Uh, my day was perfect from the beginning. I had a decent start, uh, more or less like four feet. Then uh, I overpassed the riders just after the Super Enduro. And after that, I ride my own race. I've been leaving like one hour or something like that, where it was really close following. I Sea to Sky is so demanding that of the 180 riders who started the race, just 47 reached the finish line. The others' bodies or bikes simply gave out. World-class riders like Mario Roman, Wade Young, Graham Jarvis, and Johnny Walker thrilled the crowds and gave it their all to secure a place on the podium. Wade Young has competed here several times before. This year, he finished third. Happy to be on the podium. I could have been on any one of the three boxes today. Um, we all rode good together, Graham and uh, Mario. We pretty much rode together <coughs> most of the day. Um, I was trying to save my energy a bit for that last hill, and um, Graham's just an animal, so to try to keep up with him on there, I also tired myself out a bit more. But um, you know what? I'm on the podium. Um, I've had a bit of bad luck <coughs> the last races, so to finish and be on the podium, I'm stoked. Um, I would have liked to be in first, but uh, I gave it everything today, so I'll take third. I'm happy with that. Spaniard Mario Roman was the second rider to reach the finish line. 
I'm really happy with the second place. Congrats to Raham and congrats to Wade for the podium. And really happy with the team effort, Circle Factory team. Thanks very much. Englishman Graham Jarvis took the checkered flag. The 42-year-old's many years of experience gave him the edge. I just can't believe I won because I was, you know, I was behind for so long, and then uh, I was just thinking, you know, this could, 42 years old, this could be my last chance. So I just had to keep going and, and pushing as hard as I can, and then I broke my front brake and had to fix it a little bit. But uh, <clears throat> you know, towards the end. I don't know what happened, I just, I just went for it. And that little extra effort paid off big in the end. Today, Ronnie Levstek is testing a Tucson. Hyundai has produced a compact SUV since 2005, a Korean model with an American name, like Tucson, Arizona, that's built in the Czech Republic and designed by a German. That's true globalization. Hyundai named the second generation of this crossover model the iX35 in many markets. But the current third generation is known as the Tucson pretty much everywhere. The SUV hits the streets with a striking new design and more self-confidence. And it's great fun to drive. We're testing the version with the style equipment package. Ronnie says the Tucson's no featherweight. Depending on the engine and trim level, it can weigh up to 1.7 tons. But then Hyundai wasn't aiming to build a lightweight vehicle, but rather a robust, compact SUV that's also good on long hauls. He thinks the Tucson does that quite well. At the front, the crossover's striking design can't be overlooked. The large hexagonal radiator grill that's typical for Hyundai models and the new LED headlights are both real attention getters. From the side, the Tucson also cuts a good figure. The gradually rising window line and the black cladding over the wheel wells add a touch of sportiness. At the rear, the most eye-catching feature is the horizontal tail lights, but the twin tail pipes also add to the overall impression. Compared to the second generation, the new Tucson boasts 10% more cargo space. It can hold 513 liters, or around 1,500 liters with the rear seats folded down. So there's plenty of room. Among the Tucson's driver assists are an automatic emergency braking system, which combines radar and camera data to detect if the car ahead makes a sudden stop. The two top trim lines, Style and Premium, both come equipped with a rear view camera, as well as the Smart Park Assist. The style version also features a lane departure warning system. Ronnie says there are many adjustments that can be made in the Tucson. You can lock the center differential because we have all-wheel drive. And there's a button to adjust the steering. There are two modes, sport and normal. Ronnie doesn't think there's much difference between the two, though steering might be a bit stiffer in sport mode. Vielleicht minimal erschwertes Lenken im Sportmodus. Black dominates the car's interior. The center console is well laid out and pepped up a little by the piano black details. The infotainment system is clearly arranged and easy to use thanks to its touchscreen and buttons. The leather steering wheel feels good in your hands and has just a few buttons to control the radio and the dashboard display. And though the seats aren't leather, their two-toned fabric looks sharp. The Tucson comes with a choice of eight engines, five diesel and three gasoline powered. Our test model is fitted with a 136 kilowatt diesel engine, the most powerful one on offer. It propels the Tucson from zero to 100 kilometers per hour in around 10 seconds. 
Top speed is 202 kilometers per hour. And fuel consumption is surprisingly low for an SUV of this size, just 6.5 liters per 100 kilometers. Ronnie says with the Tucson, Hyundai was one of the first car makers to introduce a compact SUV, the segment so popular that other automakers have followed suit, so the competition keeps growing. But he thinks the Hyundai Tucson will stay a contender in this segment for a while to come. Twenty seventeen was the first year Germany's Retro Classics Vintage Car Fair took place in Cologne. Previously, it had only been held in Stuttgart. Now, one of the world's largest vintage car fairs is branching out to Cologne and Nuremberg. It brings together fans, collectors, and their darlings from every continent. Among them is Walter Klein with his Ford Taunus. He explains the car's attraction for him. When he was a teenager, a friend had the same kind of car, and he worked on it a lot because his friend wasn't mechanically inclined. Vintage and classic car buffs have plenty to feast their eyes on at the Cologne Retro Classics, from historic tractors to high-powered Ferraris and Porsches to veteran Formula One racers. Wolfgang Schöneberg is here showing off his Ford GT40, a milestone in Ford's history. To him, the attraction is the excitement of sitting in and driving a car with a racing history behind it. But it all started with a card game when he was a boy. One of the cards had a GT40 on it, and he told himself he had to have a car like that someday. <laughs> Ford took advantage of the fair to exhibit some of the highlights of its 85-year company history. Twelve models from the American Automaker's classic car collection span the decades from the 1930s Model A to the newest version of the Ford Fiesta. Ford's Wolfgang Laufer says the beginning of production in Cologne in 1931, with this car, the Model A, was a major milestone for the company. More recent models attract their share of interest, too. Ford enthusiast Stefan Wackett is here with his Ford Escort. He explains that part of the vintage Ford's attraction is that they're so easy to work on. Spare parts are relatively easy to find. In terms of market share, the Escort has a status in Britain much like the VW Beetle had in Germany. So all kinds of parts are still made, and owners have little problem fixing them on their own. Ford has been producing cars in Cologne for more than 85 years now. A lot has changed in that time. Currently, more than 25,000 people from over 100 countries work for Ford Germany. Carsten Werner and Klaus Niederberger have been with the Ford Classic Department for seven years. Klaus Niederberger started with Ford in 1985 when they urgently needed automotive electricians. He'd previously worked for Bosch for 14 years. At first, coming from a family business, he felt like he was only a number, but workers can build careers at Ford too. Carson Vanna adds that he and the others learned all about these engines, but the old carburetors and distributors aren't made anymore, so today's younger mechanics don't know how to deal with them. But when he works on vintage cars, his experience stands him in good steed, and he has fun with this profession. Also on display are some of Ford's other brands, like luxury brand Lincoln. Theo Ice explains that Lincoln was the first outside company Ford acquired. It's still a part of Ford today, and the cars are still sold in the United States. He thinks Lincolns are grand. 
Die werden noch heute gebaut. Sie können super Autos in Amerika kaufen. Lenkrad sind super. Collectors' items and rarities may be driven carefully or simply pampered and polished to keep them in mint condition. These treasures are carried in on trailers. Thorsten Molwitz confirms that he only transports his cars on trailers to vintage car meets and events. He might drive them on racetracks, but otherwise he just keeps them in the garage under wraps. Now the vintage and classic car fans have put their darlings back to bed to sleep peacefully until next year's retro classics in Cologne. Next time on Drive It, sporty on the outside, roomy on the inside. That's the new VW Golf sports van. And exotic but practical, we test the Subaru Lavorg wagon.